Hey everyone, this is Flammy, and welcome back to part 2 of my interview with Jorge Yao, number 1 player in Clash of Clans, who is well on the track to getting 4,000 trophies. First player to get there, if his luck holds true. How you doing, Jorge? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm doing pretty good myself. So if you didn't catch part 1, you should check out it right now. You can find the link in the description or the annotation on your screen now. But here we are, back to the interview. So Jorge, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself for those of you listening who have missed part 1. So, um, obviously, my gamer tag is Jorge Yao, number one right now. Currently on my way to 4,000. I'm at 39.55. Um, a little bit about me personally. Um, I'm 24 years old, about to turn 25, and I live in San Francisco and work as a project manager. Sounds good. So only 45 trophies ago. Uh, when's your rough estimate for getting that, short-term or long-term? Uh, long-term, I would estimate probably... End of this weekend, short term, uh, end of Saturday night. Wow. Okay, so that's only uh, about another 24 hours on the short term. Yes. Or, I don't know, I guess two days on the long end. So uh, pretty good. That's pretty impressive right there. So uh, what do you like to do? Do you play other games? Um, I used to be more involved in first-person shooters. That's basically where I started in terms of gaming. I'm not really too much into gaming in general, a uh, casual player. I uh, started with Counter-Strike, uh, moved on to Halo, obviously, then uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, um, and never was much of a, you know iPhone or app player either. So so this is someone new to you as well? Someone new to me, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, this is basically the only app game that I play. <laughs> Definitely true for me, too. Uh, interesting how that happens. It's such just a great game. It sucks us in, even though we don't even play the genre. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so any other games beyond that or anything you want to talk about gaming-wise? Uh, not really. I mean, com Call of Duty Modern Warfare is, uh, <laughs> sometimes I wish I was playing that instead because it's a lot cheaper, <laughs> obviously. Um, but, you know, it's got its pros and cons. So were you a PC Master Race or a console gamer? Uh, both actually. I started on PC with Counter-Strike and then moved on to console when Halo came out. Very nice, very nice. Mostly console guy myself, but you know what? I try to struggle now and then with uh, getting on those PC first-person shooters. Right. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, do your friends and family know what you uh, have accomplished in this game or, and are about to accomplish? Uh, funny, funny that you bring that up because earlier this week, uh, when I when I was number one, um, first place, I actually joked around with my older brother, his best friend. Um, is currently in Wharton Business School um, pursuing something in the gaming industry afterwards. And so I jokingly sent him a screenshot and, you know, just told him to tell his friend, uh, you know, just quit now because Top Dog is already here. <laughs> you already <laughs> got it locked down. I like exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> so what was his reaction like? Uh, he was like, what is this game and uh, are they paying you? <laughs> <laughs> are they paying you? I like that as the first uh, impression reaction. You have a good answer to that? I said, uh, yes, free gems that don't give me anywhere <laughs> on Sundays, and yeah. Uh, a little bit of recognition here and there, mm -hmm. or a whole lot, as you might have heard in the previous video. Yeah, a little bit of recognition. <laughs> that's cool, that's cool. Okay, then, moving on. So this video is going to cover some high-level tactics. Moving on to the tactics, uh, can you describe your normal attack? Sure. Um, so I'm a strictly dragon attacker. So typically speaking, when you're a top level or you know higher cup, you're either a peck peck up player or you're a dragon player. Um, I've always been dragons, stuck with dragons. Luckily, the update hasn't really affected my my gameplay. Only minor tweaks here and there. But typically speaking, um, I get to fifty percent on most battles, or you know ninety nine percent of my battles using eleven drags for lightning spells. Interesting. So let's start with the first thing you mentioned, which was uh, how did the update uh, affect some players, and uh, how did it change stuff? Uh, to be honest, it turned a lot of players more into farmers because of the cost of upgrading. Uh, for me, it didn't really have much of an effect, as I previously mentioned, because you know dragons aren't affected by walls, obviously, so that had no effect on me. But um, it, sure, it surely did on those uh, on Pekka players. So. Uh, I'm sure they had to tweak their strategies or whatnot um, once the update rolled out. So the things that would affect them most are obviously the new wall levels, which mm -hmm. are much slower to go through. Uh, would the cannons be of concern? Uh, 
not so much. I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't use uh, P.E.K.K.A.s. Are, are you talking about air defense or? Uh, uh, no, just for uh, other. You said that the update changed stuff. So I was wondering if, so they added a can to, I think it was Town Hall 6 mm-hmm. or 7, something like that. So obviously everyone at high levels got a new cannon as well. Right. Did that change like the sort of attacking armies people would use or not really? Um, I, I wouldn't think so. And I, from what I've heard from top players, the extra walls, I think it's an extra, and it's an additional hit from a P.E.K.K.A. to destroy the wall, I think, I believe. Um, don't quote, you know, quote me on that. I could be wrong because I'm not a P.E.K.K.A. player, but, um, that's, you know, what I've heard from other P.E.K.K.A. players. Interesting. So, uh, that's actually a pretty big increase when it's normally like, what, two hits or something to get through? Yeah. So, interesting, a whole uh, 50% longer. So, that, I guess that would definitely change uh, things. Right. Okay, then. So, uh, would you be interested in possibly sharing one of these uh, high-level videos sometime in the future? Yeah, of course. Um, certainly would. That would be awesome. I would love to see uh, what some of these high-level bases look like when they're getting all blown up. We don't <laughs> really get to see them when we are at the top of the leaderboard just spectating. But uh, to see some destruction in action, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, no problem. Okay, Jorge, can you talk to me about uh, sort of the cost-effectiveness of these different high-level attacks? Sure. Um, so the biggest difference that I see, um, for me, I use drags because I like to save as many resources, gems, whatever, as possible. Um, it's the cheapest way that I have come up with that pretty much guarantees me 50% uh, one star every battle, um, which I use 11 drags for lightning. Um, but with P.E.K.K.A. attacks, and obviously with the introduction of kings and queens, it takes 700 gems to heal a king, a level 30 king and a level 30 queen, um, combined. So if you're using those two units every single attack, um, you can imagine how costly it would be um, per attack, especially if you're moving up one cup at a time, um, which, you know, when you're higher up cup level, that's what happens. You move up one. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, for speaking of different types of attacks, can you sort of describe how many different types there are? Is it just Dragon, Pika, Pekka? Um, so with the P.E.K.K.A. attack, it's a combination of P.E.K.K.S., Wizards, um, Wall Breakers sometimes, and those are usually, and then obviously a combination of spells, usually a, you know, a Rage spell, a Heal spell maybe, and a Lightning for the Clan Castle. Um, for Drags though, there's really typically only two combinations. Um, it's all Drags, 11 Drags, and then you either use four Lightning or some people choose two Rage and two lightning. Uh, it really depends on personal preference and what you're comfortable with using. Um, but in terms of analyzing the cost, um, I, what I found was the the Pekka strategy cost a lot, significantly more in the um, in terms of per attack. That's really interesting. So you said you're a four lightning player. Is that correct? Correct. So that means you use four lightning spells every time you attack. No, I use typically speaking, I can hit fifty percent. At three lightning, um, and that's and you know their CC troops are obviously out, but you know they're attacking my drags. But I have other drags attacking at our buildings, so I usually hit fifty percent without having to use my final third or fourth, excuse me, lightning spell. So usually it's eleven drags, three lightning. Okay, so coming from the perspective of a medium level player, I guess I'm a town hall eight, but uh, talking to you, I definitely have to call myself a medium level player. How does that uh, sort of play into how? What are you focusing down? So you mentioned that you're hitting clan castle guys. So what are you actually dropping your spells on to weaken or kill? Okay, so first three lightning spells I always use on air defense. So uh, typically speaking, if it's a level thirty queen, I use the the three lightning spells on the closest air defense near the queen, so I can take out the queen first and easy um, easier. Um, if you would try to avoid the queen, it's disastrous if things go wrong. Um, if you accidentally activate the queen mid-battle, you're, um, you know, you have a very low chance of winning. So my strategy is I like to take out the queen first, um, take out an air defense, and spread my dragons out with the outer buildings. So when the clan castle troops come out, they're only attracted to one or two or three, maybe three dragons. The rest of the dragons don't get sucked in and they're just, you know, attacking the rest of the base. So that's how I'm able to uh, only use three lightning uh, because typically, you know, the two or three drags will stall the clan castle troops while the rest of my drift spread drags will get me to 50% before I need to use the lightning. Very interesting. So it takes uh, those three lightnings to take out their defense and hopefully weaken the queen. Uh, correct. Okay, very cool. So moving on. So you mentioned when we were talking before about cheap shields. Do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, so the concept of cheap shields, uh, a lot of top players use it. It's a very um, smart process, actually, and trick that I actually just recently learned about a few weeks ago. So the concept, basically the concept is you attack from a clan that's not yours um, in the hopes of finding members in your actual clan when you're attacking. Um, And the trick is you're offering them a cheap shield, quote-unquote, by only taking one cup from them, and in return you're giving them a 12-hour shield. Now, if you skip them, some other player can obviously take more cups from your clanmate than you would. So your clanmate would gladly give up one cup for a 12-hour shield, um, then have you pass that up. So essentially you're attacking your own clanmates. So can you explain how that works? You say one cup. What does that mean in terms of stars for the rest of us who aren't quite so used to your tr- your cup counts? Oh, okay. So it, so essentially you would attack until you get to 50% one star and end the battle. So now only it, one star for one cup. Correct. Now that's only because of my cup level. I can only take one cup, so it's beneficial to both me and... My clanmates. Now, if I was around the same club cup level as my clanmates, uh, this strategy would not work because you know we would be losing cups um, on both sides. So, very interesting. So, you mentioned before that there's a revenge part tied into this. Can you talk about how that works? Right. So, by giving this service of this cheap shield and you know giving your clanmate this uh, 12-hour shield for only one cup. In return, they have you on their revenge list. So, in essence, they can revenge you back uh, for cups. But because 12-hour shield is activated at 40% damage uh, without having to, uh, you know, lose a star and lose the battle, they can do return the favor and you can coordinate a revenge where they would revenge you when you tell them you're signing off, essentially. They would revenge you stop at 42% around there, give you your 12-hour shield, uh, but they wouldn't lose any cups either because of the cup difference. Because I'm such a high level, they have nothing to lose in terms of cups. They, I'm a 60-cup, like 3-star, 60-cups win. They won't lose a single cup if they lose. So it's a kind of a win-win situation. The most they lose is the resources they use to attack me to 42%. And so there's also another win because that means someone else your own level or just below can't attack you as well because you're getting a shield, right? Exactly. So that's a very interesting, very fine-tuned and requires a lot of communication for this technique to work. Uh, right. How often are you able to take advantage of this? Um, recently, I've only taken advantage of this probably less than five times, um, and it was all this week. Uh, it's hard to coordinate sometimes when you're dealing with you know members in different excuse me, time zones and um, things of that nature. But uh, typically speaking, you know, I've only probably used it five times so far. But once again, you mentioned the previous video, you're pulling 24 and 48 hour marathons on the game. Exactly. So, so I know real- that's relatively reason. a lot for the number of times you log off. Exactly. Interesting. So what happens in the sort of situation where you log off without one of these cheap shields of your own? Um, then you're just subject to anyone else attacking you. So obviously your defense, you want to make sure that it's fine-tuned so that you know the most that they get is one star. So my strategy is I always want to compensate for a defense uh, loss, uh, which is typically uh, losing 18 or 19 cups. So I try to cushion myself uh, at the end of the se- you know attack session by um, 18 or 19 cups because I know I'm going to lose those if I go on defense. So that means you try to get at least 18 or 19 cups every time you play, which is 18 or 19 wins, so that when you lose at the end of the session, you're still at least back to where you're beginning and not losing ground. Is that right? Correct. Correct. So you're always trying to net positive by um, making up those 18 or 19 as a cushion. Now, if someone two-stars you, then you know, you're know you in the hole and you have to make those up the next session. But typically speaking, if you have a decent base uh, one star shouldn't be a problem. So that sort of seems to indicate that if it takes you like 45 minutes or an hour, say an hour in a bad case, to get those 18 trophies, mm-hmm. that's 18 hours worth of playing every time you log off just to maintain your trophy count? Correct. Wow, that sounds pretty rough. Right. And if you add in a mistake on offense where you lose 39 cups, it's even worse. 
ouch, that would be really hard. Right. So how many times have you lost in the last, I don't know, week that you've been up here? Two weeks, three weeks? Um, I probably made mistakes probably three or four times. Um, and the, and by mistake, I mean, you know, forgetting spells or um, double tapping a spell and, you know, clicking the wrong thing, falling asleep, as an example. Um, so that was one so, of them, the story you told in the previous one? Exactly. So things of that nature, you know, it's it's laughable, and it, it obviously is frustrating because you, you feel like you just wasted all that time and you have to make it back up. But, you know, as long as you keep going and, you know, you have faith that, you know, your, your strategy is good and that, you know, you have the time to be able to make it up, then, you know, you just got to push through it. That's uh, pretty impressive right there. Only three mistakes in many, many, many hours of gameplay. Uh, I'm sure you're averaging better than I am. As my <laughs> subscribers will know, I uh, love to upload my misclick videos so uh, they can see my failures in full glory. Nice. Okay, then, moving on. I'm sort of curious about the sort of atmosphere and feel at uh, high trophy counts between players. Can you talk about that? Um, so the atmosphere, it's... I would say it's a lot more camaraderie uh, between players, especially in your own clan, because everyone's so competitive when you're in a clan that's, you know, top 50 or top 10. Um, obviously, as you go up higher in, in clan rank, um, it gets even more competitive. So the competitive nature of the people in your clan just naturally, um, you know, rubs off on you and you're, you naturally just want to be as competitive. Now, obviously, the beauty of being in these clans is that we're, there's such a large network where if you do decide that, you know, you don't want to play this game anymore um, or you want to take a break, you know, there's other clans that are associated where you can just hang out and be more of a social player and less competitive. So it's also interesting because when you're raiding and attacking, you'll recognize players all the time, right? Oh, yes. I attack the same players constantly over and over again this past week probably <laughs> so does that sort of leave like a bad taste in your mouth or you or you don't know them or are you still friends afterwards how's that sort of relationship work um i don't to, to quite honest i don't know them so i you just see them yeah i just see them in um passing. exactly With now passing. <laughs> exactly so how does this atmosphere sort of translate to uh clan on clan atmosphere you mentioned within your own clan but what about between clans especially uh those clans that are vying for the top spot. Um, so there, there obviously has been a lot of discussion in terms of um, the ethics behind the, having those Sunday, you know, span clan or you know, spur up clans that come up Sunday and then just completely disappear right after the tournament. Can you explain um, what that sort of means by that? So uh, basically, um, I'm sure you know viewers have seen Phantom and other uh, you know clans that only come up Sundays and will end Sunday right after the tournament. Essentially, what they are are clans that people of high level from various clans combine together into one clan um, in the hope of getting first place to win those tro um, free gems. Obviously, um, now me personally, I don't agree with it. I don't like it. Um, and I will never do it. I could care less about the tournament. Um, I think that it undermines the whole purpose of clans to begin with. I think the clans should be, you know, a family unit. You stick together through thick and thin. Um, and, you know, just because you're number one player doesn't mean that you deserve those thousand gems every week. You know, that's not the purpose of the game. The purpose is, you know, to develop those relationships and be in a clan that, you know, treats you like your family. So do you think that Supercell sort of changed their policy? They used to sort of give uh, shout-outs to the top three clans of when that tournament ended every week. Do you think they sort of changed this in sort of response, sort of silently backing this sort of uh, disapproval that you're expressing? Uh, I believe so. I mean, I can't speak for Supercell, obviously, but I did see you know them stopping the the congratulations of the three clans because because of this um, you know issue coming up every Sunday. So. I mean, I don't think there's really an answer or solution to it without further consequences or other, you know, effects. So, you know, you just have to deal with it. But it is what it is, and, you know, you just have to live with it. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, thank you for talking about those clans following me up. As uh, someone who's lower, you see them happen all the time, but you don't really quite understand the dynamics behind them, and that sheds a lot of light on it. Right. So I've heard of this concept called revenge stalking. How does that work at high levels? 
Okay, so a little bit about revenge stalking. Um, obviously, when someone attacks you, you have the ability to revenge them. Uh, when you click on the revenge button, you, it either says the person's on shield or the person's online. Now, the concept of revenge stalking is now when you're a really high cup level and you're waiting, you know, sometimes 30 minutes for a good at battle where you're only getting one or two cups, you know, if you spend 30 minutes and end up having a successful uh, revenge stalk, that could make up the entire time of you searching just the regular uh, battle queue, let's say. Um, and the concept behind that is you're basically looking at the opponent's base, seeing uh, whether or not their clan castles filled with defensive troops, offensive troops, uh, whether their elixir storage is halfway full or almost empty, and also whether or not they're online uh, first and foremost. Now, when you do notice these signs of you know, them maybe logging off or signing off, that's when you kind of pay more close attention, keep an eye on their base, and, you know, start clicking the revenge button and hope to get lucky. So can you explain how that sort of works? You said there were these signs. Uh, so the elixir emptying out, what does that mean? Um, so the elixir storage, obviously, you know, at a top level, elixir storages are filled by gems. Everyone fills them up by gems because... The wait time is just ridiculous um, to be able to have a continuous attack session. So when their elixir uh, storages are depleting, and you can obviously see that when you go to their base, um, typically speaking, there's two things that they normally do. Um, they can either refill their uh, elixir storage if they plan on attacking more or you know additional hours, or they go on defense. It's usually one or the other. They refill elixir or they go on defense. Um, so that's where you, where you kind of look for. And if elixir, uh, elixir storages are getting low, um, you know, you have that opportunity where there might be a chance the person's going to be logging off and you can revenge them. So that's really fascinating the way you call it, like, so on defense. It's very much a push and pull game at this level. Correct. It makes it sound like a sort of a football match or some, I don't know, a non American sport that I can use. But basically, one team is on in one time, and then they're off for the rest of the next couple hours. Right. Okay, moving on, you had also mentioned, along with the Elixir, you mentioned Clan Castle emptying out. Uh, won't people have their Clan Castle full all the time when attacking and defending? Um, not necessarily. I rarely use my Clan Castle for attacking. Um, I only use it when I need to in Desperation Last Resort. Think, uh, type of thing. Um, for defense, though, it's extremely important, um, especially at our level. Um, it's it's highly important in terms of the combination of troops that you use and the strategy. Now, typically speaking, uh, I'm sure most of you use you know all archers um, for your defense, but recently people have discovered uh, a combination of maybe barbarians and archers. Um, and the theory behind that is. Once the uh, clan castle troops draw some of the attack attacking troops um, into them, if they destroy, let's say, all the archers, they'll the dragons will float to the clan clan castle to take out the rest of the barbs. Now, when they're floating, they're obviously getting gunned down by all the defenses around them. So that's a concept where, you know, it might be beneficial to have a few barbarians in there, and that's why you see more clan castle. True uh, defensive um, clan castles having both a mixture of barbarians and archers at the same time. Does it also come into play that uh, when you have just archers, they're all grouped up for lightning spells? Um, so uh, lately, I've I've noticed that archers group twice. So they group up in your clan castle, and then a bunch release at once, and then another a second set group up, and then release all at once. So due to that timing delay. Um, I typically let them just come out, and then I usually hit 50% before they even all come out. So that's where that last lightning spell, it's like, it's really just depends on how far along percentage-wise I am in the battle, um, whether or not I use that last spell. So the key is basically you want to uh, not let your dragons get distracted, the clan gossip guys, thereby allowing them to die to air defenses and archer towers and crossbows. Correct. Okay, very interesting. So speaking of crossbows, uh, crossbows have two options if you're not aware. Right. Uh, well, obviously you, Jorge, are aware, but any viewers, if you're not aware, you can either set them to target ground or set them to target air, and there's different ranges of both of these. What is preferred at uh, top levels? Uh, air, 
is preferred. Now, I have seen rarely a uh, few people use a combination of air and ground, but generally speaking, uh, it's safe to say that majority it's all air. And why is that? Uh, the reason behind that is because of dragons. Now, um, with my strategy, obviously, if you take out an air defense and you don't have your exabo, your crossbows on air, you only really have two defensive buildings or units that can really do serious damage to dragons, um, the last two air defense. So you need anything and everything you can get um, to defend against those dragons. Now, obviously, if you set them to air, your range is smaller, so um, against P.E.K.K.A.s, it might not be as great, but there's always a trade-off, so... Very interesting. Thank you very much for that. So that's going to wrap up our high-level tactics section. That was a uh, very long and very detailed and very interesting to me, and I hope all of you guys is uh, look into uh, high-level tactics. So we're going to be moving on to more about the game and about uh, sort of your plan. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for part two of three of this interview. So stay tuned for more in the near future. Subscribe if you haven't, and be sure not to miss out on that. Jorge, do you have any final words? Yeah, um, just keep clashing on, um, find a good clan, and have fun. Uh, I want to give a few shout-outs to, obviously, first and foremost, uh, my clan, North 44, the leader, Levesters, uh, a few other friends, uh, Clan Holland, for being so supportive, as well as a few members of Awakening, Riva, Crystal, and Tina. Yes, indeed. Thank all of you for helping out Jorge so he can be where he is today. And thank you, Jorge, very much for being here, spending some time to talk to me and share all of your knowledge with all, everyone out here on the Internet. For everyone out there on the Internet, stay tuned for part three of this interview coming up very shortly. What are we going to be doing in there? Well, Jorge has some advice for new and upcoming players and trophy hounds. He's going to be talking about his thoughts on the future of the game and balance issues, as well as his plans for once he reaches his 4,000 trophy goal. You won't want to miss out. Stay tuned, guys, and as always, have a great day.